All right, let's look at some other priorities for care airway. So one of the things that makes a patient a very high-risk patient, um, one of the things that prompts admission into a burn care facility because it's considered a major burn um, injury is that they've been burned either in a confined space and being burned in a confined space makes you predisposed to what's called carbon monoxide poisoning. So we discussed a little bit in the hematologic portion how normally on, an, on a hemoglobin molecule, there's spaces for four oxygen molecules. Well, when a patient is in this confined space, they don't have, you know, they don't have the exposure to room air oxygen. They have more exposure to the byproduct of the burn, which is carbon monoxide. And this carbon monoxide has a lot more affinity to this hemoglobin molecule than, than oxygen does. So it just bullies, it bullies its way off this molecule and it takes the place of oxygen on the molecule. So now what you have is carboxyhemoglobin. So as you can probably surmise, instead of oxygen having this other CO, the patient won't be oxygenated. So this is a life-threatening um, circumstance. One of the very kind of peculiar things about it is that when patients being monitored on a pulse oximeter or even when you draw an arterial blood gas, it won't reflect carboxyhemoglobin. It, so it may reveal a nice healthy O2 saturation, 100%, whatever, whatever 95%, but in reality they are suffocating because carboxyhemoglobin is really there and oxygen is not. In addition, this carbon monoxide has the effect of vasodilation. So the patient may appear kind of a cherry red color when in reality they're suffocating. So it's two really peculiar things about carbon monoxide poisoning. Other things to pay attention to in terms of airway is, you know, you want to make sure that you're aware, did the, you know, uh, was there smoke that occurred? Um, in the face, and is there risk of laryngeal edema or airway closure? Because, you know, just like the inflammatory response causes change in capillary permeability and shifts in fluid in the capillary, the same thing could occur in the tissues of your airway. So if there is a risk of being burned anywhere from the neck up, even from the chest up, you have to assume that this patient is at high risk. So if you're noticing you know, burns anywhere on the face or neck, and then there's going to be that swelling, that edema could occur and airway closure is arrest. Does the patient have singed nasal hairs? Are they dyspneic? Are you hearing a strider, which is that really high-pitched noise that occurs when patients barely have air moving through? Let's look at another priority for care in this phase is the presence of what's called circumferential burns. So circumferential burns, is kind of the name kind of gives it away, is a burn that occurs all the way around the circumference of something. So it could be a limb, it could even be your torso, it could be you know, the lower extremity limb, anywhere where it burns all the way around. So when that occurs and it's that eschar that is formed, which is that charcoal, dark, um, inelastic tissue that forms when a tissue is terribly burned, that eschar is not very um, compliant. That eschar does not allow for swelling underneath it. So when that occurs, when a circumferential burn and the eschar is formed not allowing for, you know, the tissues to kind of leak out and, and have a swelling, you could obstruct arterial blood flow. So one of the things that you need to have happen here is something called an escarotomy. So an escarotomy is an incision that is cut down the length of this, whatever it is, the extremity in this case, to allow the tissues to expand underneath the escar. So that kind of sums up your top three priorities in this emergent phase, which is ensuring that there's an adequate airway with air moving in and out that fluid and electrolytes are restored, and that there is um, sufficient arterial blood flow to all the extremities.
So moving on over to the acute phase of care, remember that this phase sets in when the patient shows a response to all that fluid resuscitation. So when the diuresis occurs, now we're not worrying so much about meeting that 50 milliliters per hour of urine output mark because we are definitely showing signs that the capillaries have healed. So what occurs in this phase is indeed the tissues are starting to heal. The capillaries are now not leaking as much. So what will you see? Copious urine output, improved blood pressure, and elevated central venous pressure, just improved numbers overall. So your fluid replacement needs now would diminish, not as high a priority as it was. Still needs to be managed though. Are colloids appropriate? Now remember, in that capillary leak syndrome phase, even those large colloid proteins like albumin were able to shift out of that intravascular space. So colloid administration in that emergent phase is contraindicated. Whereas now in the acute phase, capillaries are healed. Now colloids may be something on, on the care plan, may be appropriate. Pain control, certainly always a priority, but making sure that they are getting sufficient or adequate perfusion with ABCs being a priority. Now we really need to focus on the pain control. Remember pain control, not only because we want them comfortable, but because being comfortable is going to decrease that stress response. And the stress response, you know, elevates cortisol secretions, elevates blood sugar levels. It's just not associated with better outcomes. So definitely pain control and comfort. Uh, the concept of debridement. So what debridement is, is removing that dead skin, removing cellular debris, because debris is really, if, if it's not um, viral skin or vital skin, then bacteria are going to migrate to it. Bacteria is going to, are going to settle in to cellular debris. So it's really important as part of the daily care is to remove that debris. Now there's different ways to do it, different approaches. Something called enzymatic debridement. Special enzymes can be applied to the wound and that are supposed to allow for the, you know, that the debris can easily be removed. The only downside of the enzymatic approach is that it will remove some of the healthy skin, some of the alive skin, so it's not a perfect science. There's a manual debridement, something as simple as a tweezer. It's pretty, you know, hard work, but sometimes that's, you know, what's required. There's also just good old hydrotherapy. So putting the patients in a shower two times a day, morning and evening, to remove that debris decreases the risk of an infection if the skin is clean and that the debris is completely removed. Grafting. So this is the time where you have to, you know, Look at grafting, you know, this is all a specialty science, so you don't need to know everything about these areas, but you do need to know they exist, and your priorities are certainly preventing infection. So if you can understand, you know, the signs of infection and that you're continually evaluating the patient for signs of infection, then you're doing great. So grafting is the uh, science and the art of, you know, promoting better wound healing. You could use human skin and, or human dressing to place over the patient's wound, or you can use uh, tissue from other um, animals, like porcine grafts is an option. Autografting is an option, which means that if you haven't been you know, too terribly burned, where too much of your total body surface area has been burned, then you can actually take the, the graft from your own self, because it's your own tissue, and that's obviously going to be the most compatible, and then apply it to that burn, burned wound. Now, the only downside of this is that now you've created another wound. Now you've created a whole other burn, so a whole other site for infection. So it's really kind of a good news, bad news. There's something called compression dressings or compression garments that can be applied. Um, this is one way to prevent the contractures that set in. Um, when there's something called this hypertrophic scarring sets in, it will uh, limit movement of an extremity, so this will minimize that. It also improves um, venous return to the heart because it prevents venous stasis, so it's kind of like what sequential compression stockings do. So that's um, another thing that is um, possible in the care and recovery of the burn patient. So what are our priorities here? Definitely infection. You know, this is your first line of defense against infection is your skin, is your epidermis. 
So when that has been altered and you are at very high risk for infection, the invaders have a free-for-all. Nutrition, calories, these patients are hypermetabolic. You know, also the first line of skin helps maintain a normal body temperature. So when you have a burn patient, those patients are going to be cold. They're going to be hypothermic. And so that's going to increase their needs for calories. In addition to, they're trying to heal wounds. So they're hypermetabolic for a myriad of reasons. So very, very high calorie diet. So sometimes they're requiring not only a high, you know, PO diet, but in order to supplement those calories even more, you put total parenteral nutrition on top of that, uh, keeping the, the room, or their space warm because they're not able to maintain a normal body temperature. That's something that you might have to do, make their ambient room temperature warmer. Continuous attention to their fluid and electrolyte needs, but it's certainly lower now on the priority list now past this emergent phase. And just to be aware that this is a patient where their whole life has now been turned upside down. So, you know, interprofessional collaboration is important, especially as we're looking toward exit from acute care, um, you know, social work to look at, you know, how, what kind of environment are they going home to? Do they have the support? Are they able to financially sustain themselves? You know, all the psychosocial changes that have to be uh, attended to or the, or the patient's psychosocial needs, physical therapy, occupational therapy, even beyond discharge, and a dietitian to ensure that their um, needs for calories are met.